Let's begin where we should begin. And many people begin at 1054. And they have a fairly superficial approach to this discussion. Before I prepared for this um, podcast tonight, I, I'm watching a variety of um, YouTube videos where there are uh, people who've become uh, Roman Catholic. They've, uh, they've converted and they say, well, why didn't you become Orthodox? Uh, especially, I think this uh, 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 Pines from Aquinas had a number of those, uh, those kinds of discussions. And what was characteristic of the, uh, of the discussions was that the question of the schism was quite misunderstood and superficially treated. And that's fine in a podcast, but there seemed to be a lot of ignorance of the prehistory and what led up to it and what really happened uh, and why it happened. So we're going to do our best to treat that. We've done it already in our, ecclesi- uh, our, our class on ecclesiology. So some of this is going to be repetitive if you've seen that class, but it's good to be repetitive. And, and, and uh, we're going to add a little bit to it that we didn't do in that class. If you're interested in this, go into more in depth. We recommend you go to that. Um, and that is um, uh, this class here, Orthodox Ecclesiology, the Eighth Ecumenical Council, and the Great Schism especially. But this whole series over at YouTube.com, Orthodox Ethos, this whole series, a 10-week series on the uh, history, uh, the uh, dogma of the church, the ecclesiology of the church. And in this particular lesson, Lesson 5, we're dealing with what we're going to be doing, talking about tonight. So let's begin and look at this. Now, this is a very, very important ecumenical council. Many of you probably don't even know that there's an eighth ecumenical council, and there's actually a ninth ecumenical council. There's not just seven, even though many Orthodox in the English-speaking world uh, repeat that without understanding what they're saying. There are nine ecumenical councils in the Orthodox Church. They've been accepted and embraced throughout the Orthodox Church as as, uh, recent uh, as 2016. Uh, in Crete, they were uh, declared uh, councils uh, of the Orthodox Church, and all of the decisions are normative. So, this is um, a very, very important council. If you don't understand what happened here and the prehistory, which we go into in the in the course on ecclesiology, you can't understand the schism, and you can't understand what happened in 1054, or uh, for that matter, from 1054 onward. Uh, so this. Council is essential. Now, it was held in 879 under the presidency of Patriarch Photios the Great. Uh, it was in the Temple of the Holy Wisdom, which you see on the left there, uh, Hagia Sophia in Constantinople, and it was attended by 383 fathers. Now, again, there are several things going on throughout the 870s, 860s, and 70s, which are really important to know. We can't get into tonight, but there's uh, the Council under the uh, of holy wisdom that uh, uh, preceded this. There's the robber council under Ignatius that was repudiated later. There's a lot going on. There's the co- council that condemned Pope no- Nicholas. Uh, and uh, so if you want to go deeper, go to the ecclesiology course, go to that particular lesson and uh, and listen to the whole thing. And you'll, you'll get much more. But we're going to focus quickly on this council. It, was confer- it confirmed the seventh ecumenical council. And it anathematized those who rejected it. So what is it? Why is that important? Well, there were uh, those who did reject the Seventh Ecumenical Council among those in France and among the Franks. Now, the Franks are going to play a huge role. They're the na- one of the main reasons why there was a schism to begin with, uh, their political uh, uh, ambitions and, and machinations had a lot to do with why the Pope of Rome uh, eventually um, took the path he took and turned back this council. Uh, so we'll talk a lot about in that as we go forward here. So it's a very important that this council accepted and embraced the Seventh Ecumenical Council. And that was not an accident. It was directed in part, all great councils except the ones before them, but it was also uh, directed in part against those heretics who still had not re- accepted the council. Uh, the Seventh Ecumenical, which there were iconoclasts still around at this time. And so it also recognized the most holy patriarch Photios as the only legitimate and canonical patriarch and outlawed the, and repudiated the councils which had been held against Photios in Rome and Constantinople. Now, I need to stress that at this council, there were papal legates. 
they were representatives of the Pope who embraced all of the decisions of the council, and you shall see, so did the Pope in many letters. So this is very important and significant that these, uh, that the Pope and, the, and his legates rejected the previous councils of, the, of his predecessors in Rome that had condemned St. Photios. And his council decreed that the symbol of faith should remain uninnovated, without innovation, without change, immutable forever. And it uttered horrible anathemas against any person that should dare to add anything to the creed or to remove anything from the creed. And of course, most of you should know that there was an addition to the creed, which is the cause, uh, is the heart of the cause of the schism and the, the beginning of this terrible adventure of the departure uh, of the West from the communion of the four patriarchs in the East. And so those who did that, who added to the creed, they are under anathema by this eighth ecumenical council. They turned away from the council. And that's really, really, really important to understand. If you want, if you're looking for the truth, you're not yet decided, you're a Protestant looking into Orthodoxy, Catholicism, or you're a Catholic who's kind of wondering what's going on, why are we in chaos, uh, why is uh, the Pope outlawing the Latin Mass, and all kinds of other things that are going on in the world today uh, in Catholicism. Well, it's important to know your history, important to know where this all began, why it's not 50 years old, it's not 100 years old. It goes way back, and I would say it begins right here when the when the West turned its back on the council that it had embraced. Now let's learn a little bit more about that. Let's see. What's important to realize that this council was recognized as the eighth ecumenical council, not only of course in the East but in the West for two hundred years, for more than two hundred years. Uh, and it wasn't changed until long after the schism, after the after the, the break in communion and the walking away of the Pope from the communion with the rest of the Eastern patriarchs. After that, as in uh, decades and decades after that, they said, oh, wait a minute, we don't actually believe that anymore. We reject that council. And it's really important to understand that. But let's see what this council did this council officially prohibited any addition to the creed, as we said, rejecting then the filioque, which was in use in many churches in Western Europe at the time, though not in Rome until 1014 or 1009, actually, and 1014 as well. There were two major events we'll talk about. It implicitly rejected the principle of papal supremacy or jurisdictional authority over other local churches in that this council rendered null and void the pro-papal Ignatian council in Constantinople 10 years later, 10 years earlier. So let me just repeat, why are we starting here? Because you have to start here, right? We said this, we, we entitled this talk tonight, After a Thousand Years. So you might be thinking, well, we're going to talk about contemporary Catholicism. Well, we're going to talk about a lot of things from then to today. We're going to end up in the day. But it's not the most important thing is to understand how we got here, right? So you got to begin at the beginning. And this is very important that this council of 383 fathers, including the papal legates, rendered, rendered null and void that council which the Pope had inserted his authority over Constantinople. They rejected that. And therefore, they rejected the idea that the Pope was a supremacy over the Patriarch of Constantinople and over uh, the churches in the East. And one of the greatest ironies of Christian history, the Phocian Council, the Eighth Ecumenical Council, was recognized as legitimate by the papacy for nearly 200 years until the period of the Gregorian Reform, when the canon lawyers of Pope Gregory VII rejected this council as the Eighth Ecumenical Council and named the one that had condemned Photios 10 years earlier and had the support of the previous popes as, uh, as eighth, uh, the Eighth Ecumenical. But it's very interesting that they, well, they showed their hand that they knew that that was the Eighth Ecumenical Council. We'll see that in a second. So how did it happen that Rome, now dominated by the Franks, came to abolish an Ecumenical Council? So now we're, we're up in the time of the 11th century when they overturned their acceptance of Eighth Ecumenical Council. How did that happen and why? We'll get back to the schism in a minute, but let's let's see, why did they overturn this council? So important, right? Well, scholars, including Roman Catholic scholars, 
point out that Roman Catholic canonists first referred to their Eighth Ecumenical Council, the Ignatian one, in the beginning of the 12th century. So in the beginning of the 12th century, 1100s, uh, canonists start to say, but it, it's, a, it's a process that's going on in Rome, this, this re-evaluation, uh, that, yeah, well, actually, no, 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 we, we embrace the other council. And they did it because they deliberately wanted to get a hold of a canon that was passed during that council, Canon 22, which supported a very strong and robust papacy. So that was just real power. We need that canon to, to, to support our power, uh, our ambitions here in the West. Important fact, however, they overlooked the fact that this council had been canceled all by another the council under Photius, which they had in their archives, right? So they just kind of overlooked that somehow. It is interesting to note that later on, Roman Catholics called this this Phocian council. That's actually not accurate. It's the Eighth Ecumenical Council, uh, the False Eighth Ecumenical Council. So thereby acknowledging it implicitly as another Eighth Ecumenical Council rival to its own choice. And in that way, they reveal that something's going on here that uh, they recognize that it was called and understood as an Eighth Ecumenical Council. So... Very interesting that the, there's a, the Pope who comes after Nicholas condemns his stance. Uh, there was a condemnation of that Latin Eighth Ecumenical Council, that anti Phocian Council, the one they later recognized as the Eighth Ecumenical by Pope John VIII. Is it's it's uh, in a letter that he gave to Emperor Basil, Emperors Basil, Leo, and Alexander. And this letter, which was read at the second session of the Ecumenical Council, Constantinople in 879, the Eighth Ecumenical, and it's included in the second act of, uh, of the minutes, he writes the following. And first of all, let's see. And first of all, receive Photios, the most amazing and most Revered High Priest of God, our brother Patriarch and co-celebrant, who is co-sharer, co-participant, and inheritor of the communion which is in the Holy Church of the Romans. Interesting. And he sees that it's is a co-participant and co-sharer, an inheritor, not just another bishop across the other side of the empire. Receive the man unpretentiously. No one should behave pretentiously following the un unjust counsels of his predecessors. No one, as it seems right, to many who behave like a herd of cows should use the negative voice of the votes of the blessed hierarchs who precede us, Nicholas, I mean, and Hadrian, as an excuse to oppose him. Since they did not prove what had been cunningly concocted against him. So he says, look, they made a mistake. They were wrong. They condemned him and they shouldn't have done it. And so do not listen to them. They made a mistake. We're going to reject them. Now he's being very gracious. Uh, but he could, be, he could have, he, he's basically rejecting everything they did and their counsel. Everything that was done against him, he said, has now ceased and been banished. So peace in the church, let's move on. In a similar letter, he wrote to Patriarch Photos himself, he says, As for the synod that was summoned against your reverence, we have annulled here and have completely banished and have ejected from it from, from our archives. We got rid of it entirely. We don't recognize it at all. Because of the other causes and because of our blessed uh, predecessor, Pope Hadrian, did not subscribe to it. And so apparently Hadrian did and then did not. But Nicholas certainly was one of the most uh, pre-schism, most assertive of papal power over the rest of the church. And... He goes on and he says, in chapter 10 of his uh, Comunatorium, was read by the papal legates at the third session of the same council. He says, we, Pope John VIII, wish that it is declared before the synod that the synod would take, which took place against the aforementioned patriarch photos at the time of Hadrian, my most, most holy pope in Rome, and the synod in Constantinople should be ostracized from this present moment and be regarded as annulled and groundless and should not be co-enumerated with any other holy synods. So this is the basis for the unity of the, at the time for the, for the end of the hostilities 
And it lays down basically a roadmap for the future, which if they had kept it in the West, there would be no schism to this day, but they turned their back on it. There is no doubt to anyone who surveys this literature that the Latin position is untenable. In other words, the one that overturned 879. Council of 879, the eighth ecumenical council in Hagia Sophia under St. Photius is that which annulled the Ignatian one, enumerated the seventh, we said, restored unity, and laid down the canonical and theological, here's what's most important here, the theological basis of the union of the church, the East and West, through its horos. So it, it implicitly rejects any addition, and of course it has in mind the filioque, because everything that preceded the Ecumenical Council, the, 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 the problems that were created were in Bulgaria among missionaries from the West, the Franks actually coming down and wanting to impose the filioque on Orthodox people in Bulgaria, the Orthodox from Constantinople also had missionaries there. So we know the context is clearly pointing toward uh, the question of the filioque and the council rejects it uh, forcefully. And let's just read quickly a, a portion of the horos, the decision, that's the, the boundary. That's what it literally means, horos, right? The, the decision or the um, declaration of the Eighth Ecumenical Council. Jointly sanctifying and preserving intact the venerable and divine teaching of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we expel those who remove themselves from the church and embrace and regard worthy of receiving those of the same faith or teachers of orthodoxy to whom honor and sacred respect is due as they themselves order. Thus, having in mind and declaring all these things, we embrace with one mind and tongue and declare to all people with a loud voice the rule or oros of the most pure faith of the Christians, which has come down to us from above through our Holy Fathers, following the Holy Fathers, subtracting nothing, adding nothing, falsifying nothing. For subtraction and addition, when no heresy is stirred up by the ingenious fabrications of the evil one, introduces disapprobation of those who are exempt from blame and inexcusable assault on the fathers. And it goes on, they go on and they say, thus we think, uh, this is after they've recited the creed without the filioque, right? So they, they recite the creed that has been handed down to them without any addition, because that was anathema. And they declare, thus we think, in the, this confession of faith, we were baptized through this one, the word of truth proved that every heresy is broken to pieces and canceled out. We enroll our, as brothers and fathers and co-heirs of the heavenly city, those who think thus. So you think thus, meaning you accept the unadulterated creed of the Holy Fathers. So there's a two part to that, as we all know, it's both the question of obedience and humility and following the Holy Fathers and the actual theological question at stake, which is a anathema to the church as well as the addition. And he goes on and they go on here and they say, if anyone, however, dares to rewrite and call rule of faith some other exposition besides that of the sacred symbol, which has been spread abroad from above by our blessed and Holy Fathers, even as far as ourselves and to snatch the authority of the confession of those divine men and impose on it its own invented phrases. Filioque, that's what they're talking about here. Evias evrosiologias. And put this forth as a common lesson to the faithful or to those who return from some kind of heresy and display the audacity to falsify completely, to falsify completely the antiquity of the sacred and venerable. There were people at the time and still are who say that, that the uh, Orthodox, that the Eighth Ecumenical Council uh, subtracted the filioque from the creed. That's how absurd and ignorant the people were uh, among the Franks. And so they're saying, they're, 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 they're making reference here to uh, you know, the falsification of the uh, creed that has come down to them. And the antiquity of this sacred and venerable ordos rule with legitimate, illegitimate words or additions or subtractions, such a person should, according to the vote of the Holy and Ecumenical Synods, which has been already claimed before us, be subjected to complete defrocking. If it happens to be one of the clergymen or be sent away with an anathema, if he happens to be one of the lay people. So exactly like the council before the holy ecumenical councils anyone who does not obey is anathematized and the clergy are defrocked and so this applies to those who have embraced the filioque which is exactly what they're describing in addition to the creed which is unwarranted and is uh, anathema the bishops unanimously agreed and proclaimed 
we read in the we read in the minutes of the sixth act that after reading the Horos, the bishop shouted. Thus we think, thus we believe, into this confession we were baptized and become worthy to enter the priestly orders. We regard, therefore, as enemies of God and of the truth, those who think differently as compared to this. If one dares to rewrite another symbol besides this one, or add to it, or subtract from it, or remove anything from it, and to display the audacity to call it a rule, he will be condemned and thrown out of the Christian confession. So not only is the oros there stated, then they say it again, and they say very explicitly, in addition, they obviously have in mind the filioque. For to subtract from or to add to the holy and consubstantial and undivided trinity shows that the confession we have always had to this day is imperfect. So you're implying that we have an imperfect confession when you add the filioque. So obviously they're talking about the Trinitarian. It's a Trinitarian doctrine. What else are we talking about? It's the filioque. It condemns the apostolic tradition and the doctrine of the fathers. So you add the filioque, you condemn the apostolic tradition and the doctrine of the fathers. You're, the arrogance that you have in changing this, which has been handed down to us and has been forbidden to change. If one then, having come to such a point of mindlessness as to dare to do what we have said above and to set forth another symbol, call it a rule, or to add or subtract from the one which has been handed down to us, by the first great holy and ecumenical synod of Nicaea, let him be anathema. All right, can we get any clearer? Can we get any clearer, brothers and sisters? What else do we need? 